DLC has become a dirty word in the industry lately because several companies have abused its implementation and practice in a lot of ways. From pre-order DLC that contains iconic characters that are implemented on day one, to loads of cosmetics that have confusing packaging and outrageous amounts to purchase with. DLC sadly has now become more associated with sleazy business practices. However, Nintendo hasn't exactly gotten too involved in the DLC market, but when they have, they've shown how to do DLC right in a lot of cases. Hyrule Warriors is a prime example of this, with additional characters that fight a lot differently, and more new content for the user to actually get involved with. And the latest example is the two sets of DLC to the fun and chaotic racer Mario Kart 8. While the first DLC came out earlier this year, the combined DLC's content includes 16 new maps, 6 new racers, and a new mode for those who haven't completed the cups of 50cc to 150cc and a new mode 200cc. So, is this content, which can be bought in individual packs for $7.99 or both for a combined $11.99, worth the price of a mission for what it adds to an already fun experience? Well, I'm here to show you and tell you exactly what you get and whether it's worth it in the end. So without further ado, let's start the review. Uh, start the review? Show the footage? Wait, what do you mean we can't show the footage? Oh, no, you gotta be kidding me. Oh, right. Lovely. I forgot, the Nintendo Creators Program. Now, despite the fact that people believe it's only for Let's Plays and doesn't affect critical coverage of any sort, the use of content ID and the description of the About page for the channel seems to indicate that any Nintendo copyright is affected. And of course, the legal department of Nintendo hasn't exactly answered any problems regarding it. Damn it, how am I gonna do this video review? I can't show the footage. Guess I'm gonna have to find another way of doing it. Now, as mentioned before, Mario Kart 8's new DLC gives you four new cups, with seven remastered tracks and nine new tracks, six new racers, and a bunch of new parts. But honestly, the biggest part of the release more than anything else is the tracks. So I'm going to go into each individual track and indicate how I feel the track adds to the game, whether it feels like a reasonable addition or it's just more of the same. Now, I know that the 200cc is the biggest change here. However, that update is free, so you don't have to purchase the DLC in order to get it. So I'm going to focus on the tracks to begin with. Please note, I'm not exactly the greatest of Mario Kart fans. I like playing them here and there. But if you're looking for a technical breakdown in terms of high-level gameplay, you're not going to get it from me. Excite Bike Arena. The classic motorbike track comes to the Wii U with the classic bumps and jumps from the old NES title. What I love about this is that it keeps the old style with the long stretches of straight paths like in the original game, only being a large oval and having two significant turns. It adds some reasonable hazards between the grass and oil that was seen in the original title, and Nintendo captured the essence of the game that I played in those weekends in the days of old. Now, if my guy could only run back comically to the bike after he crashed as opposed to being picked up, that would be fantastic. A quick and short track that keeps the action up and is a good breather for the cup it's in. I'm a sucker for simple and easy to pick up tracks, and needless to say, this one is right up my alley. 9 out of 10 for that track. Dragon Driftway. The twists and turns of this Chinese influence level didn't sit well with me at first, as you'll notice little details like the ancient drawing depicting warriors of generations past on the wall, all while you ride down the back of a giant dragon that circles around on itself. If you look carefully, there's a shortcut or two that you'll be able to take advantage of as well, in addition to making it a little bit easy to fall off and get yourself killed in a sense. It does feel like they added something here with the twisting and turning element of it, and while I won't want to play it repeatedly, it's a good change of pace. 7 out of 10. Hyrule Circuit. Ah, one of my favorite series, and there's a good mix of timely shortcuts and a bunch of hazards. Love the addition of rubies into the game as opposed to coins, and being able to take a tour of Hyrule Castle is fantastic. It makes you wonder if they're testing the idea of making a Zelda-based racer. I wouldn't be surprised. The iconic Master Sword is a great shortcut to use when activating it, and this is honestly one of the perfect maps for me. Except for those goddamn plant enemies at the end of the stage. Screw those enemies. 9 out of 10. Neo Bowser City. The bright neon colors of the stage make it light up, and I admit it gains some points for that. The track has some pretty tough curves at certain points, and the mix of the turns and ledges keeps it interesting seemingly throughout the race. 
and that's seemingly though. It's one of those tracks that although the ledges and turns are there, it doesn't really stand out. It just does the jobs in terms of visuals. In terms of the track itself, it's pretty forgettable in my opinion. It's not something I'm jumping the race over and over again, even though it seems to be a technical marvel in terms of a different type of track. Honestly, it just doesn't stand out and that's why I gotta give it a 5 out of 10. Baby Park. The definition of a change-up track. It's a small, short track that can keep the pressure up due to everyone being in a crowded space. And even those being lapped can affect the race in some manner. I love this being added because it feels like something new, something different than the rest of the maps that you've seen so far. And that's the perfect kind of map to add to the list of tracks you've gotten. It's a good change-up map. The roller coaster and theme park background does wonders to add to the simple nature of the track, and it truly does feel like a baby park. A fantastic addition and exactly what you should expect out of DLC. Something new and something interesting. 9.5 out of 10. And yes, I know this is a changeover from another map in the series. It's basically a port. But that's the thing. That's a good selection. Wario's Goldmine. Now there's a personal bias here. I really hate this map. I hate this map, I hate this map, I hate this map. I never got the handle of it after playing it over and over again, and it felt annoying more than anything else. There's a shortcut that you can take on the left, but feels like the, the cart comes down at the wrong time, well, you're shit out of luck, as the gap is very small to make it through in that case, which doesn't help in feeling like Lady Luck is exactly what this map has to play against. In addition, the bats in the middle are just annoying slowdowns. In fact, that's what it is. It feels like the map is very, very slow more than anything else, and it's probably why I have major problems with it. There is some technical skill to take advantage of here, but honestly, compared to the other maps, it just doesn't work for me. 3.5 out of 10. Rainbow Road. I know people love Rainbow Road, I get it, but did we need another ported one? Granted, I like the variation on the SNES track, although I'd rather have the iconic N64 any day of the week. It just feels like we always have to have another set of Rainbow Road tracks, when I felt the position could have been given the better tracks. I do like the ability to take advantage of the waves caused by thwomps, and there are some difficult turns here, so the track does all right in terms of challenge. There's one corner in particular that I always fall on. But in the end, it's just sort of average at best, and I felt like you could have added a little bit more variety. And I'm just sick of Rainbow's Roads. I really am. 7 out of 10. Yoshi Circuit. It's a track in the shape of the Yoshi. How could you not like it? The Yoshis on the side do add to the track and its ambience, but due to the nature of Yoshi's curves, you'll have plenty of drifting opportunities to take advantage of. You'll need to watch out for piranha plants towards the middle of the track, but the variety of the track is where its strengths lies. Unlike the inconsistent Mute City, for example, the variety of the track is consistent throughout. It keeps things fresh. I know that sounds weird, but it does. And you'll have to stay on your toes the entire time to take first. Overall, it's an 8 out of 10. It's a good track. Big Blue. The music saves this map to a certain extent, but I will admit something here. I've never been a fan of tracks that don't repeat in terms of laps. And while I love the backdrop, the water section of this map just felt weak in particular. But honestly, I think I know exactly why I have a problem with this map. The lack of speed and boost pads. F-Zero is known for its speed. It's a speed demon. At least that's what I remember. This in particular feels really, really slow. And because of that, it gets a low score. 4 out of 10. Animal Crossing. A relaxing small track that's pretty straightforward in implementation as you go from the forest world of the Animal Crossing world to its sandy beaches as you race your fellow competitors. The hazards here are minimal. Just be aware of Mr. Rossetti at the end of each lap, or he'll catch you napping. It's a good way to finish off the cup with more of a straightforward race, but it's honestly pretty boring in the whole. And while the iconic characters from the world are there, it feels like they really missed the mark here. There's not a lot of excitement and not a lot of, you know, just fun here. 4 out of 10. Ice Ice Outpost. The unique feature of the Ice Ice Outpost is the fact that there are dual tracks that intertwine with each other, which adds a great level of tactics and strategy attempting to get the best amount of shortcuts out of it in changing over each path. I love these kind of maps despite the frustration of possibly hitting walls repeatedly due to the massive amounts of options it has, and no two runs may feel the same depending on it. While we've seen a couple of tracks like this before, and I kept on hitting wall after wall while playing this one, I was loving every moment of it. 9.5 out of 10, a well-designed track that will keep the competition up. Cheeseland! 
I'm just trying to understand how cheese land came to exist. The hazards are upped in this case between the Swiss cheese like holes in the track to the enemy chomp chomps attempting to get just a bite out of you to take you out. It's a good mix up track throughout, but honestly, the desert attempting theming doesn't work well due to it just feeling like someone said, we need a, need a clever way of making a desert track without calling it a desert track. I know, we'll make it cheese. They won't notice. Good track, bad theme. Six out of 10. Ribbon Road. I never played the GBA game, honestly, but this is one of my favorite tracks. I love the little additions of the toys added here from Mario's games past. And honestly, it's a good track in terms of little details. But beyond that, there's a good mix up of turns, hills, and obstacles. I love those Mecha Bowsers. I need a real one. In fact, if you keep on falling off the world, you'll see more of the hidden elements that are embedded in it, which is probably not good for a racing portion of a game. Every race I had on it was tight, which to me was a great sign of a good map. I know, it may just be the experience overall here with the races I had on it, but it really did feel like a solid addition of a great map from days of old. 9.5 out of 10. Wild Woods. I like it. The variety is the strength here, with the waterfall section turning into the lily pads, and even the flying sections that I normally hate due to the slowdown in gameplay feel right here. A good shortcut here and there, a set of multiple paths, and variety is the name of the game. It's the kind of track that grows on you over time. At first you're sitting there going, nah, this isn't gonna work, but then it starts getting better and better as things go on, and so you'll wanna be keeping it in the mix repeatedly. Again, it's a good change up map, and that's exactly what you want from a DLC. Eight out of 10. Overall, the set of maps here do a great job of giving a sense of variety, with some great choices of bringing some maps from old games like Baby Park and Ribbon Road, but good new additions in Hyrule Circuit and Wild Woods, which add a bunch of new variety. While not every track hits, as there are some stinkers in the pack, Animal Crossing, in my opinion, what you get here is, again, variety. It's exactly what I'd hope to get out of a DLC pack such as this. In the end, the DLC is definitely worth a buy and gets an 8 out of 10 as an overall package with the tracks alone, which is more than worth the purchase. Why? Because those who are looking at it, those wanting to get more content out of Mario Kart 8, it hits that target audience and shows that when it comes to products and deliverables, Nintendo knows what they're doing. Now look, it's, this is my opinion. So as always, leave your feedback and your thoughts below, and I'll see you next time on the channel. Hey everybody out there, my name is Sean Joy, aka Dragnix, and you just watched a video on Mario Kart 8 track DLC review. But you probably guessed by now that it had nothing to do with that. I mean, don't get me wrong, that is my opinion about the tracks in question and the review of the entire DLC as a whole. But the reason that the video was created more so dealt with the Nintendo Creators Program. For those who don't know, the Nintendo Creators Program, and I'll put some links in the description below, deals with... IP related to Nintendo and YouTube content creators. YouTube content creators can make videos via an, uh, the Nintendo IP in exchange for a portion of the revenue made on those videos. Nintendo also gets a cut. Now, there's always been that question, whether or not the content creators and whether or not the original IP owners deserve the co content in question in terms of the advertising revenue. The fact of the matter is, you're using Nintendo's property, property, you are advertising them in a certain extent, but you are using their content for your own personal gain. Now, there, this is where things get a little bit muddy. The fact of the matter is, is that, well, how much are you there for the actual IP in question or how much are you there for the commentators in question or how much of it is a transformative work. But the thing is, is that that's always where the argument goes, the let's play portion of it. People don't understand or seem to realize that that doesn't necessarily mean that critical coverage isn't also affected by this. You look at that web page and you get a very big idea of the fact that it's any Nintendo copyright coverage. And that includes video coverage, and that really bothers me in terms of how they've set that up. The fact of the matter is, is that critical coverage and reviews and anything like that are set up in certain countries to avoid the IP in question to protect the consumer. The fact of the matter is, is that you want to give that con those people a fair shake in terms of a fair review. If it's influenced by the possibility of, let's say, a, the IP creators claiming the content, people may decide not to do that coverage which is a bit of a problem or be more positive in terms of maybe let's say i don't know it getting promoted by the company in question you see that's the problem 
even though there may not be a negative connotation to it or may may not be nefarious means it has that sort of stigma about it and that's the major problem that's why that's why there are protections against that you don't want critics not giving you the full story the true story about things and so that's what i wanted to highlight now Nintendo comes from a world in Japan in which there are cultural differences. The fact of the matter is, from my understanding, there is a respect for elders, a respect for tradition, and the fact of the matter is is that they may not understand the new media world that we are in right now. But the way they've implemented their program is very negative in terms of critical coverage, in terms of people not covering it. Angry Joe is a fine example of that. Now, those may argue that Angry Joe had no right to knowing that the rules were in place that he had no right to be angry about his reaction to the Nintendo claiming his content question. But you have to understand something. Take a look at exactly other channels that are doing it too. Let's take a good example, the Game Grum, somebody who I love, so they love to watch. They just started a series about Punch-Out and is monetized. Hold on, that's on the Nintendo Creator Programs list. Are they gonna get claimed? They've done Super Mario 64. Now, I haven't noticed the advertisements on that one. YouTube's a little bit weird. Sometimes advertisements just go away after a while. Maybe they do it only after a certain amount of days. I don't know. But it's weird because of the fact that, hey, guess what? They're also using the coverage, too. But only Angry Joe's really been hit with the copyright claim. Now, have, hasn't he? It makes you wonder why he was hit and other ones, Dashy Games or, for example, Jaywitz, haven't. And that's where the problem lies now, isn't it? Now, don't get me wrong. That may not be purposeful. That may be me just sort of having my tinfoil hat on. But let's let's face it. Angry Joe, Total Biscuit, anyone along that line is more a critical games coverage. It, they are people who are going to point out the flaws. And while others may point out the flaws too, they may do it with a more positive spin or a more, you know, understandable sort of reluctance to do so not to say that they're gonna lie about it not at all more so the fact that I think when you think about Angry Joe for example he's he's gonna be critical about it he's gonna point out those little things that are gonna bother him about a game and that's what I'm scared of the fact of the matter is is that if you use copyright law and c coverage like that to sort of negatively influence those who don't want to cover it in your way that's where things get dicey and that's where coverage could be influenced and I don't want to hit a world where we're in a sit situation where people are sitting there going can I believe what they're saying or they're they are making revenue off of this and Nintendo's making revenue off of this it's a very very scary world out there in terms of the way that Nintendo's sort of wielding this at this point now don't get me wrong Nintendo may not realize that and the fact of the matter is, I've attempted to figure out what exactly Nintendo is. Hence those two emails at the start of the review in question indicating that, you know, I did reach out to them. They haven't responded for over two months. It really is a little bit concerning at this point. I just wanted to bring a little bit more attention to this issue because it is a major problem and I do want to push pressure on Nintendo. I know it's not going to do it. I know it's the fact of the matter is, is that there's just too much in the industry right now for Nintendo to you know focus on some small YouTube channel at this point but I felt like I had to do something and that's what this video was so if you do li did like this video you know hit that like button share it with some friends and if you do are a YouTube creator or feel like you need to get involved you know talk to Nintendo you know write them up and say hey what's going on with this you know what's going on with your Nintendo creators program that seems to be completely out of touch with the YouTube space alright I will see you all later and I hope you all have a good day